Welcome to Ugaritic, Old Testament 800, held at the Blue Ridge Institute for Theological Education in Roanoke, Virginia. This particular lecture is the first of several related to Ugaritic. This particular lesson covers the alphabet, or the Alpha Beta. So let's get started. The ancient city of Ugarit was located significantly north of Israel on the Mediterranean Sea, located on the northwest coast of what is today the country of Syria due east of the most northern tip of Cyprus, a country known in ancient times as al -Ashia. The city of Ugarit thrived until 1185, when a combination of invading armies, likely the Sea Peoples, coupled with severe famine and food shortages, led to the destruction of the city. While being invaded, the last king of Ugarit, King Amurapi, not to be confused with the more famous Babylonian king Hammurapi, but Amurapi, called for help from his allies, but by the time supporting armies arrived from Carchemish, further east in Syria, Ugarit was already a ruin. Ugarit is actually geographically closer to modern-day Turkey, known as Anatolia in ancient times, and the location of the Hittite and the Hurrian empires, with which Ugarit had trade relations. And yet Ugarit's language has far more in common with the language of its eastern and southern neighbors, what are considered Semitic languages, like Babylonian, Hebrew, and Arabic, than with either Hittite or Hurrian. This similarity with other Semitic languages is the reason that Ugarit is found useful for biblical scholars today, wishing to more fully understand the nuances of Semitic languages like Hebrew and Aramaic, and is the primary reason why Ugaritic is offered at the Blue Ridge Institute. Ugaritic is considered a part of the Northwest Semitic language family but that is not purely because of Ugarit's geographic location to the northwest, although you will notice from this orange box on the map that it is indeed found to the northwest of the Arabian Peninsula, with eastern Semitic languages being to the east of this orange box, including Babylonian and Akkadian, and old Arabian languages, which classify as southern Semitic, and Arabic, also part of southern Semitic, that are to the south and southeast of the orange box. Ugarit is indeed in the northwest, closer to Turkey, and is in the extreme northwest of this northwest box. However, it is the characteristics that Ugaritic shares with other northwest Semitic languages that places it in that family, rather than its geography. This family tree of Semitic languages is helpful for distinguishing the different types of Semitic languages that exist, or are thought to have existed in the ancient Near East. Proto-Semitic is a theoretical language that has been reconstructed by working backwards from the other known Semitic languages. It is theoretically considered the parent language of this entire family. Eastern Semitic is most famous for Akkadian, Babylonian, and Assyrian. Western Semitic produced Central Semitic and Ethiopian, Ethiopian obviously being found in the ancient country of Kush, what is today modern Ethiopia, where Amharic is still spoken. Central Semitic has been divided up into Southern Semitic, which is Arabic, as well as other old South Arabian languages in the Arabian Peninsula, and the one that we're interested in, the category of Northwest Semitic, which itself can be divided up into three categories, Aramaic from the Persian Empire, Canaanite from the land of Canaan, and Ugaritic from Ugarit. Ugaritic is different from the other two languages because of the fact that it is cuneiform, using wedged-based letters rather than the normal letters that we get from Aramaic. Phoenician and Hebrew are the two categories of Canaanite. Hebrew has a lot of similarities with ancient Phoenician, but Hebrew also has a lot of similarities between Aramaic and Ugaritic, which is why we're able to study this Northwest Semitic group as a family even though technically Canaanite can be distinguished from Aramaic languages. Northwest Semitic languages can be distinguished from other Semitic languages with two marks. First, all Northwest Semitic languages insert an extra vowel when forming the plural of single syllable nouns, such as king, which is the root malk. In Ugaritic, malk is found as malku, malki, malka in the singular. In Hebrew, malk is found as the singular noun melech. 
one would expect the masculine plural of malk, or melek, in Hebrew to be malkim, or in Ugaritic, malkuma. Instead, Northwest Semitic languages have an extra vowel inserted between the second and third root letters. So the plural of malk in Hebrew is actually malakim, or in Ugaritic, malakuma. All Northwest Semitic languages also make use of diphthongs, where two letters have combined to form one. In Ugaritic, an A-class vowel plus a wow or a vav gives us the letter O. An A-class vowel plus a yod gives us the letter E. Typically, we will end up with a circumflex over the O or over the E as we're transliterating in order to indicate that there has been a formation of a diphthong. However, even though Ugaritic has these two marks because it is a Northwest Semitic language, Ugaritic is not a Canaanite language like Hebrew. Because of that, the accented long A did not become an O as it did in Canaanite, what is often called the Canaanite shift. So in Ugaritic, we have shalom, which is peace, rather than shalom, which is Hebrew, with that long O. The long A has become an O. That does not take place in Ugaritic. We still have shalom. There are also no causal hyphial type perfect verbs in Ugaritic. We don't have a causal verb type in this language. There's also no intensive PL type perfect verbs in Ugaritic. Neither the causal nor the intensive are found in Ugaritic. The first person plural pronoun is na in Ugaritic. In Canaanite languages, Phoenician, Hebrew, it is nu, anach nu. The na stays in Ugaritic. There's also no definite article in Ugaritic. Not all Canaanite languages have a definite article, but many do, like Hebrew, but Ugaritic does not. And yet, despite the differences between Ugaritic and other Northwest Semitic languages, there's still quite a bit of overlap within that Northwest Semitic language group between Hebrew, Aramaic, and Ugaritic. That makes it useful to know this particular Semitic language. The ancient order of the Alpha Beta, or the alphabet in Ugaritic, is established by the discovery of clay tablets, most likely used by scribes to practice their cuneiform letters. This is actually not the only order of the alphabet. There is a second order that is occasionally found on inscriptions and tablets, where, to use the Hebrew designations, He, Lamed, Mem, and Chet are actually found together early on in the alphabet, instead of the order that you see them below. To use the Ugaritic descriptions, that would be Ho, Lambda, Mem, and Chota. We also need to note that there are three vowels in the Ugaritic alphabet. There is A, which is at the beginning of the alphabet, and I and U, which is located at the end of the alphabet. This is actually the vowel A, I, and U with the consonant Aleph. So in Hebrew, we have one Aleph. Technically, in Ugaritic, we have three Aleph with each of these vowels. You'll also notice that there are some symbols that we don't have in English, nor do we have them in Hebrew. So we'll have to learn these letters in particular to make sure that we recognize them when we come across them in transliterations. The first letter of the Ugaritic alphabet is Alpha. You may notice the similarity between Alpha and Aleph in the Hebrew alphabet. In each of the following slides, I have placed how we would designate this particular letter in English characters, since again, we'll be working primarily with transliteration, and then also the equivalent in Hebrew. Keep in mind that not all Ugaritic symbols have a designation in Hebrew or a corresponding letter. However, where they are available, I have indeed marked them. This is Alpa, pronounced A. Ah. This symbol is Beta obviously corresponding to the Hebrew consonant bait, represented in English by the letter B. Gamla is the next letter, corresponding to Hebrew gimel. It is represented by the English letter G, and sounds like G. The fourth letter in Ugaritic is Cha, 
This corresponds to the Hebrew letter Kaf without a Dagesh. If you know the alphabet song in Hebrew, you recognize the Ka Ka. However, most Hebrew grammars do not ask you to pronounce Kaf differently with or without the Dagesh, so this may be new to you. We designate this with an English symbol H with a small smiley face underneath it. The Ugaritic letter delta corresponds to the Hebrew letter Dalit with a Dagesh. It is represented by the English letter D and is pronounced D. Ho, the sixth letter of the Ugaritic alphabet, is represented by a simple H in English and corresponds to the Hebrew letter He and is pronounced the same. The Ugaritic letter Wo corresponds to the Hebrew letter Vav although technically it corresponds to the Hebrew letter wow and is pronounced wo. It is not vav corresponding to vo. It is represented by an English letter w, reminding us again that it's w, not v. Ugaritic zeta, which corresponds to the Hebrew zion, is represented by the English letter z and sounds just like it, z. Chota in Ugaritic corresponds to the Hebrew letter chet and is represented by an H with a dot underneath. It has a rough breathing sound, similar to ha represented earlier, but this is the true correspondence of chet and is chota. Tet corresponds to the Hebrew letter tet and looks a lot like chota, the difference being that it is missing the little caret symbol at the bottom of the main down slash. This corresponds to the English letter T and sounds just like it. T. Yod in Ugaritic corresponds to Yod in Hebrew and is represented the same way that it is represented in Hebrew with the letter Y in English. Kaf, which is represented in English by the letter K, corresponds to Hebrew Kaf, but specifically Kaf with a Dagesh to distinguish it from Chaf. This is Kaf with the hard K sound. The letter Shin is found in an unusual place in the Ugaritic alphabet, after Kaf and before Lambda, not at the end of the alphabet where its corresponding letter in Hebrew is found, Shin. There is no Sin in Ugaritic, which makes the identification a little easier. We only have Shin. It is represented in English by S with a Keron over it, that little downward pointing symbol. It is pronounced Sh. Lambda which is recognized by the English symbol L, corresponds to Hebrew Lamed and is pronounced the same, L. Mem in Ugaritic corresponds to Mem in Hebrew and is designated by the letter M. Mem only has one form in Ugaritic. There is no final form as there is in Hebrew. It is pronounced as M. The Ugaritic letter Thal has no corresponding letter in Hebrew. It is represented in English with a D with a line under it. It is most closely associated with the TH in the English word this, although it is more back of the palate, more of a th, kind of the top of the roof with a tongue and then a combination of D and TH. Thal, thal. The letter nun in Ugaritic corresponds to nun in Hebrew and is represented by the English letter N. This particular letter looks like zu, however, this is not a z sound the way the zeta is. Instead, this letter is represented by z with a dot under it. Some scholars have suggested that it is more akin to val, although more back of the palate and more emphatic, val. Others have suggested that it is more like tsade and has more of an emphatic ts sound almost being more emphatic than the tsade that's found later in this alphabet list. The reality is there is no corresponding letter in Hebrew that is exact. In some places, this particular letter is used in place of Hebrew sade, but in other places it's used in place of other Hebrew letters, so that there is no direct correspondence. It simply needs to be recognized that this is its own distinct letter, however that worked within Ugaritic, distinct from Zeta, distinct from Val, distinct from Tsade, and needs to be understood as its own marker. The Ugaritic letter Samka corresponds to the Hebrew letter Samik and is represented in English by the letter S. Most scholars agree that this is a simple S sound, S, 
Ugaritic, like Hebrew, has two S sounds. There is no sin in Ugaritic the way that there is in Hebrew, although there is a shin that we saw earlier. Instead, samka is one of those S sounds. And then at the end of the alphabet is another S sound, which we'll look at in just a moment, usually used to translate loan words from other languages, such as Hurian, when they're transliterated into Ugaritic. Some scholars have suggested that this is not an S sound, but was more of a TS sound, but those scholars are in the minority. The argument is based on the fact that there is an S sound at the end of the alphabet, so surely this couldn't be a second S. However, again, we see the same pattern in Hebrew where there are two S sounds that are distinct from one another. They're not the same letter, sin and samik. So it is not really out of the question to have both samka and the letter at the end of the alphabet, the SSU symbol used for transliteration. For now, we will consider this, like most scholars, to be an S. The Ugaritic letter ayin corresponds to the Hebrew letter ayin and is an unvoiced guttural. It is represented by a backwards apostrophe, with the frontwards apostrophe being used with the letter A representing alpha at the beginning of this lecture. The letter ayin is typically represented in grammars using this black symbol here called a Winkelhaken. That's a German term, which is a lot of fun to say, Winkelhaken. However, ayin typically does not show up this way on tablets Instead, it is usually rendered by some form of triangle, either a normal triangle or turned a little bit to the left or completely flipped over the horizontal axis. Either way, ion typically has a completely flat side on one of its sides, the, the bottom, or to use the bottom example here, the top. It does not usually have the indented side that the Winkelhaken has here to the left. So this is a bit misleading. In the real world, you should look for ion to resemble a triangle, not a Winkelhaken. As much fun as that is still to say, Winkelhaken. Pu corresponds to Hebrew pe, is represented by the English letter p, and has a p sound. Sade in Hebrew corresponds to Sade in Ugaritic. It has two downward slashes as opposed to the three downward slashes of lambda. It is a TS sound. It is represented by S with a dot under it. Kopa in Ugaritic corresponds to Kof in Hebrew. It is represented by a Q in English. However, it does not have a K sound. It has a almost hard K sound. K, Kopa, Kof. Rasha corresponds to Resh in Hebrew and is represented by the English letter R, R. The Ugaritic letter Thana corresponds to the Hebrew letter Tav without the doggish line, the soft pronunciation of Tav, represented in English by a TH. You'll notice that Thana is reproduced by two overlapping symbols, which is easy to reproduce in computer graphics, a little bit more difficult to recreate on a clay tablet with a stylus. Because of this, Thana actually appears more like the Star of David on ancient tablets than by the symbol pictured here. This is another sound that we do not have in English, but it does exist in Arabic. This is Ghayan. It is a rough guttural. This is a gimel sound almost, but it is a back of the throat like ayin. So combining those two letters, you get more of a Ghayan. Again, it's that rough G guttural sound. There is no corresponding letter in Hebrew. To is the tav of Hebrew with the dagesh, the plosive, or the tav with the dagesh line that we're more familiar with. This is the hard T sound. Again, just as in Hebrew, we have two hard T sounds. We have tet in Hebrew, and we have tav in Hebrew. We have tet in Ugaritic. We have to in Ugaritic. However, they are not the same letter, even though they sound the same and need to be kept distinct. This is the vowel letter I in Ugaritic. You'll notice that it's technically an aleph with an I vowel, sort of like alpha at the beginning of the alphabet was aleph with an A vowel. However, this does not have a different name. It's just simply the marker for the vowel letter I. 
It has a number of different pronunciations, most of them related to E or A in pronunciation, similar to a Hiric or a Seire in Hebrew. This is the vowel letter U. It is the equivalent to Aleph with a U class of vowel. We have three written vowels in Ugaritic, the A class vowel, the I class vowel, and the U class vowel. When these are written, they are written using these three vowel symbols. However, other vowels are understood even though they are not written in Ugaritic words, similar to the way that vowels are not written in Hebrew, but are occasionally marked by a he or an aleph or a vav. The same is true in Ugaritic, except they're only marked with aleph. We know where the other vowels are inserted into Ugaritic words, because Ugaritic words, even in the ancient world, were translated and transliterated into other Semitic languages or other ancient languages. And using those languages, which oftentimes did have vowels, were able to reconstruct the vowel patterns of Ugaritic. So there are other vowels that are understood when we read, but are unmarked. Whereas when they are marked, they are marked with these three vowel letters, these three versions of Aleph. This particular symbol is unusual in that it is only used when bringing words from other languages into Ugaritic, most commonly Hurrian. There is no corresponding symbol in Hebrew. The symbol in English is S with a backwards accent mark. It's rendered as SSU in terms of its name because it is often found with the vowel U. Again, it is found at the end of the Ugaritic alphabet and is used for transliterating words from other languages, giving it a simple S sound. As we mentioned earlier, there's debate whether Samka had a soft TS sound or if it had a true S sound. The fact that this particular symbol is often used for an S sound for other languages does raise the question as to whether or not Samka had the same function. Now that we have talked about the Ugaritic alphabet, it's important to talk about all the exceptions. Diphthongs are the combination between a vowel and the consonant yod or the consonant wo. For instance, when we get the letter a or alpha plus the letter yod, we represent this by the English letter e with a circumflex, that pointy symbol over the e. The same is done when an A or an alpha combines with a wo, and we get an O with a circumflex because we get an O sound. A, Y, even in English, is A. This is represented, however, by an E. Think say re in Hebrew, the long E. Here we have E with a circumflex. An O is easy to represent. It's more like a holom vav in Hebrew, an O plus a circumflex. Ugaritic at times will use a mark between words. It looks like a little small triangle represented here. In English texts, as we've transliterated the Ugaritic, we translate it with a period, marking the space between the words. However, there is not always an actual symbol between words, but we still may insert it in our English rendering. At times, Ugaritic letters are not written correctly, just like sometimes letters in other languages are written defectively. In fact, sometimes instead of the three expected wedges or lines, there are maybe four for a letter. Occasionally, a letter will have a variation. Sometimes thal will look more like pu, but with the tips crossed to the right. Ayan may sometimes rotate instead of pointing to the left. It'll be look more like a hill, almost like a circumflex up in number one. Again, we don't often go from the Ugaritic texts directly to a translation. We use the transliterated text most of the time. However, in those instances where you choose to look at the actual clay tablets or online renderings of them, you may need to remember that certain letters change and look slightly different than you would expect. Well, that brings us to the end of this particular lecture on the alphabet. Hopefully you have found this informative. Feel free to go back and watch it as many times as necessary in order to master the content.